Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm told that very uncharacteristically, Secretary Kerry went on a little bit longer than, than planned, so this is going to be a very staccato 13-minute interview. Mike, uh, Ambassador Froman, thank you so much for, for joining Great me. To be here. Um, you are um, in the midst of big trade negotiations in the Pacific and across the Atlantic, big, ambitious um, continental trade um, talks, trade and investment talks, but you still don't have fast track negotiating authority. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you've, there's been any significant trade deal in US history concluded without fast track. What are your chances of getting fast track after next Tuesday, after the midterm elections next, next Tuesday? Well, uh, trade promotion authority, as you, as you say, is the mechanism by which Congress gives us our marching orders about what to negotiate, how to work with Congress during the negotiation, and then what process they'll use to approve uh, an, uh, an agreement. And to us, the key thing is, is that trade policy, probably more than any other area of policy, is one that where the executive and Congress needs to work closely together. Mm -hmm. So we've been consulting with Congress throughout all of these negotiations. With TPP, we've had more than 1,500 meetings with Congress on TPP, and that doesn't include TTIP or any of the other agreements. And the key thing is that Congress has significant input into our negotiations mm -hmm. so that when an agreement comes out, they're going to be able to, to, to vote and be comfortable with it. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, this is an area where there's a lot of bipartisan uh, support for, for trade. It's one of the areas that cuts across party lines. It's one area that we think we can make progress uh, in, and we look forward to working with Congress um, uh, after the election on trade promotion authority and on our trade agenda more generally in a way that has broad bipartisan support. Now, this is one area where the Republicans are actually more in tune with the administration than the Democrats. Are you secretly hoping for a Republican victory next week? I think, uh, I think, our, I I think our position yeah. as an administration is, uh, is well established on that. You've got, uh, you know, you've got uh, other speakers on politics. All I would say is this is an area where uh, that we need to work bipartisan uh, on all of these issues. We're working very closely with Democrats to ensure that our trade agreements uh, address our interests as well as our values. You know, TPP, for example, is going to have the strongest labor and environmental provisions of any trade agreement in history. It's going to be the first agreement that takes on the issue of state-owned enterprises and make sure the state-owned enterprises, when they compete with our private firms, do so on a level playing field. Uh, it'll be the first trade agreement that establishes rules for the digital economy, mm -hmm. brings into the digital economy certain disciplines from the real economy. And all of this is about unlocking opportunity for American workers and, and farmers and businesses of all sizes, particularly small businesses, who need these kinds of rules to be able to navigate the global economy. So just to pin down the TPA, the fast track thing, by when are you going to need it in order to conclude these, both well, these like big... The, the, the timing, the timing is an issue, uh, obviously, right. for Congress to consider. For us, the key thing is, is that we move forward with Congress on a basis where we have as okay. broad bipartisan support okay. as possible. So the big, the big one before you now in terms of your agenda is the, um, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, you've got the, after the midterms in 10 days from now, you've, well, in, in 20 days from now, you've got the big APEC summit um, in Asia. Do you expect to conclude um, a TPP deal there without fast track? Is, is that something that's realistic? No, no, we do not expect to have a final agreement on TPP at APEC. Uh, APEC will be an opportunity when all the TPP leaders will be, will be present, so it's a good opportunity for them to have conversations with each other about TPP, about whatever outstanding issues are left, and to give more political impetus to getting it done. And so what are the big sticking points? I mean, you've got the Japanese, US, the familiar conversation there about dairy, agricultural access to the Japanese market. That's right. Um, you've got intellectual property. Um, what are the things that are tying you and your negotiators down um, uh, most strongly? Well, I, I'd say the, 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 the outstanding issues fall in a couple of different categories. Market access, which are the heart of the mm -hmm. trade agreement. Uh, clearly, we have agricultural issues with Japan and with Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, we're making uh, good progress with Japan and hope to engage with Canada uh, soon. We also have issues of autos with, with Japan. And then you've got the rules, as mm -hmm. you said, intellectual property rights, uh, state-owned enterprises, labor and environment. Those are all areas where we've made tremendous progress, including at a ministerial we just completed in, in Sydney a couple of days ago. Uh, so we're making very good progress in closing out issues, narrowing the differences on the remaining issues, but we still have a little ways to go and we're going to continue to work it. 
So I'm going to get on to TTIP, which I think has more controversy around it at the moment in a, in a second. But you do need, ultimately, to have stronger majorities of American public opinion behind you for, for, for trade deals in this environment. Um, it's particularly tough. Do you think that um, you are doing enough to convince the American people of the benefits of these kinds of deals? And what, what, what's the core argument for, you know, what's your elevator pitch to the American electorate about, about TPP, for example? Well, look, the core argument starts with the economics. And it's absolutely clear, with 95% with of the world's consumers outside the U.S., 80% of the purchasing power outside the U.S., for our ability to grow here, to create good jobs, and we know that export-related jobs pay more than non-export-related mm -hmm. jobs, we've got to be engaged in international markets. Our market is already quite open. Our average tariff is about 1.5%. Mm -hmm. We don't use regulations as a barrier to trade, but that's not true around the world. So through these trade agreements, this is how we shape the global economy, how we shape globalization. And by reducing barriers disproportionately to other countries, we help increase exports from American workers and American farmers, helping to grow jobs here, grow mm -hmm. wages here, strengthen the middle class here. So that's, I think, the first part of the argument. The second part is it's vitally important that we are proactive in helping to set the rules of the road for the global trading mm -hmm. system. And that starts in the Asia Pacific, the fastest growing region in the world, where there are multiple models out there about how global trade ought to be conducted. And we think it's important that we have a race to the top with strong labor and environment. So this is about China. I mean, well, this to, is to this is about degree. ensuring that there's a strong mm -hmm. rules-based trading system mm -hmm. that reflects our interests and our values. And that's what we're trying to achieve through through TPP. And then thirdly, I'd say there's a strong strategic importance. Mm -hmm. This is about this is a key part of our rebalancing strategy towards Asia. It helped, we are a Pacific power. And TPP is the way in which the U.S. will be embedded in this region economically, and that will have broader spillover benefits as well. So then, then Senator Obama in 08 campaigned on getting proper environmental and labor standards into NAFTA. And you mentioned that this is a part of the, the TPP. Can you describe exactly what protections we're talking about? Sure. I mean, when, when, when Senator Obama was running for president and said we wanted to renegotiate NAFTA, that meant taking labor and environmental issues which were literally sideshows, literally side agreements in NAFTA, mm -hmm. and pulling them into the center of NAFTA and having strong obligations and making them subject to the same kind of binding dispute settlement that mm -hmm. exists for all the other provisions. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing through TPP, not just with regard to Canada and Mexico, so it's not just a renegotiation of NAFTA, but more broadly establishing that as the standard for this region and conceivably for the global economy. And this, and this passes must, uh, for, because I know you talk to all the, all the players, all the interested parties here at home, is passes must with the unions, with the AFL-CIO, that they're, they're happy that this is... Well, this we have a lot of contact back and forth with, with our, uh, our, our colleagues in the labor movement. They've had a lot of input into the agreement, uh, both the labor chapter and other elements of the chapter, the state-owned enterprise chapter, the rules of origin, uh, et cetera. Um, I won't put words in their mouth about where they stand on the agreement, uh, but we certainly have worked to ensure that this agreement raises labor standards and is good for American workers. And it'd workers. be enough to, for you to get the backing of the unions for, the, for this. Well, again, I'm not going to put words in their mouth. You'll have to, you'll have to ask them. But, uh, but ask I will him. say that we're, we're working to ensure that this has the strongest labor environmental protections ever and that everything we're doing through this agreement is about helping to drive production and manufacturing in the United States. When you look at all the factors that, that we have in the United States, so, you know, it's a great market. We've got strong rule of law. We have an entrepreneurial culture. We have a skilled workforce. Now we have abundant sources of affordable energy. When you layer on top of that TPP and TTIP, it means we'll be at the center of a web of agreements that will give us unfettered access to more than two-thirds of the global economy. And that makes the U.S. the production platform of choice, the place where investors want to put their next factory, both to serve the U.S. market, but equally importantly, to ship all over the rest of the world. And that's going to help drive job creation here, good jobs, good manufacturing here in the United States. So in terms of binding China into a system, a higher standard of rules with global trade and investment, TTIP with the Europe, the transatlantic trade and investment par partnership is equally important. If you can do both of these, the Pacific and the Atlantic, we're talking about well, more than two thirds of the world economy. China is right. not going to be able to pick and choose, um, uh, pick people off bilaterally. Um, You've got a new European Commission. You've got a new president of the European Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. The, um, the Luxembourg 
former Luxembourg Prime Minister, um, he gave a, a little bit of a sort of blind, blindsider last week um, uh, by moving the um, portfolio of um, deciding the investor state relation, investor state dispute settlement mechanism out of the hands of the, the new trade commissioner, um, Celia Malmström, the Swedish trade commissioner, into a political, um, into the political court, um, his vice president, a Dutch socialist called Timmermans. That took you by surprise. I think it took a lot of people by surprise. My question to you is, if the European Commission decides not to include investor state dispute settlement in the TTIP talks, is TTIP worth pursuing? Is this a deal breaker for the United States? Well, first of all, we, we welcome uh, the appointment of the new commission. We're looking forward to them getting seated. And we see this as an opportunity to have a bit of a fresh start in the, nego in the negotiations. You know, with regard to investor state uh, dispute settlement and investor protections uh, generally, none of us, neither the United States nor the European Union, want to do anything that's going to constrain the ability of our governments to regulate in the public interest. And in fact, that's why we have worked through our other negotiations, TPP and otherwise, to raise the standard on ISDS, to make it absolutely clear that governments can regulate in the public interest. And to add because the political, the political debate in Europe says this is a charter for multinationals basically to get round. That's correct. Governments. That's so correct. And, and we think it's very important that governments be able to regulate and that we have certain safeguards to ensure that uh, these procedures are, are used appropriately, that we can dismiss frivolous claims, that we can award attorney's fees, that we can make it fully transparent so that labor unions and not NGOs, civil society organizations can participate. They can observe uh, the, the hearings of They can courts. not only participate, but they can um, submit briefs. Um, but that's not what most people think in Europe. Um, they think that this is a sort of a, a charter for multinationals to trample on, on democracies. That's the, that's the popular perception. Well, I think that's why we need to make um, it absolutely clear what it is and what it isn't. And that applies to a number of things in TTIP. There's a lot of mythology out there about what it is we're trying to negotiate or what it is we're not trying to negotiate. I think it's very important that we be proactive and that the Europeans be proactive about getting the correct story out there. None of us want to compromise the ability of our, of our governments to regulate. And um, all of us, though, think that investment protections, you know, ISDS fundamentally gives investors, our investors abroad, the same rights we give foreign and direct investors in the United States. The right to be, not be subject to discriminatory or arbitrary treatment. Indeed. And in fact, that's what part of a high standard trade and investment agreement is all about. And when we launched TTIP, the US and the EU agreed that we would have the highest standards of any agreement that we've each negotiated in this area. Um, is TTIP without that clause worth having? Well, look, I'm not going to negotiate uh, here. I'm looking forward to seeing down with our counterparts You're welcome and, to. And, and, and going through this. I'm but it's it it hard to imagine a high standard agreement. This is intended to be an agreement that's a model for the rest of the world. It's hard to imagine a high standard agreement that doesn't have the high standard of investment protections as well. And that means raising the standard. Europe has uh, 1,400 agreements. Uh, that have ISDS in them. Uh, the U.S. has about 40. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the most active users of investor state are European companies, I not American Luxem companies. I believe Luxembourg has originated a lot of these. Uh, it, uh, perhaps so. Uh, and so, you know, I think um, it's important that we, we, we uh, look at the, the, the accusations out there, take them very seriously, because I think it's very important that our publics, both in the United States and Europe, recognize that that we get it, we don't want to compromise the ability of governments to regulate, but at the same time we see that making sure that there is non-discriminatory uh, regulation that doesn't uh, have arbitrary impact on investors, because we know that investment feeds jobs back at home as well, that those are key parts of a high standard agreement. So I think we haven't got much time left, but in terms of your, um, your expectations for a Europe deal, um, and your expectations for a Pacific deal. What kind of deadlines, what kind of time frame are we talking about? Could you get a Pacific deal by January, February? Well, as we've always said, we think the substance of the negotiation ought to drive the timetable. The fact is, uh, we've just come out of this ministerial in, in Sydney. I think we all, all 12 of us in the TPP, see that the, the final agreement is being crystallized and we can see where this is, is heading. Uh, we are closing out issues, we're making progress on market access. We still have a ways to go, and uh, we're not going to live by an arbitrary deadline, but we're all focused on getting it done and with as Europe, soon as possible. And with Europe, um, if you put the Edward Snowden stuff behind you, I mean, you've had a lot of snafus in terms of 
dialogue with the Europeans? Does having a new commission does, uh, draw a line under some of the difficulties that you've had in the dialogue over the last year or We so? worked very well with the old um, commission as well. My, mm -hmm. my, my, uh, my counterpart there has been a, a very good partner in this. Uh, but with the new commission, it gives us an opportunity to start fresh and to lay out a work plan uh, for, the, for the coming months and to make progress on the outstanding issues. Thank you for allowing me to machine gun you with questions. Thank Our you. Time is up. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew.